In this video, I'm going to cover the content for 20.3, the Merit, which is M2. M2 requires you to compare the radiological and biological properties of radionuclides that are used in imaging. We will refer to four isotopes for radionuclides in this part of the assignment. Technetium 99M, very common tracer. Iodine 131 Xenon 133 and Sallium 201 Those are all isotopes that are used with the gamma camera so, it's, so they all emit gamma radiation though some emit more than gamma radiation other types of radiation so by radiological properties, we're looking at the features of the radiation that's emitted, the type of radiation that each isotope emits, the energy level of the radiation, the half-life of the nuclide, and so on. Biological properties refer to how it behaves inside the body, how it interacts with the body. I'm going to list the properties that you need to look at. In the, context, in the context of these particular isotopes, and then I'll go through each one in more detail. So, uh, let's do the physical over here. Number one, I've got the type of radiation. Number two, we have the half-life. You're going to see that we'll refer to three different half-lives. So first one here, this is the physical half-life. Number three, it's the energy level of the radiation. Number four, the chemical properties. Exactly where you categorise that as a physical or biological property is uh, debatable. But I'll put it there. Biological, we have the biological half life. Now, when you combine mathematically the biological and physical half-life, which I will run through, you get the effective half-life. So we'll see more about that in a moment. Number six is the behaviour inside the body. Those are the properties that you will need to compare for each of these isotopes. So let's go through each one of those and look at it in more detail. Firstly, we have the type of radiation emitted. Now, you, I'm sure you can appreciate that the gamma camera detects gamma radiation. So the gamma is what we need for our imaging to take place. All of these emit gamma radiation, uh, but some emit more than just gamma radiation. They emit other radiations. So if they emit beta or alpha, so that one we want, those ones we don't want, they're not contributing to our image in any way. However, they will contribute towards the dose that the patient receives in their body. Moreover, uh, because gamma is more penetrating, most of the gamma radiation will go through the body. But beta and alpha, they're less penetrating, so more of that will be absorbed by the body and won't escape like gamma radiation. So we want gamma radiation. And if you can have a pure gamma emitter, then that's a real bonus because you're getting just the radiation that you need that will contribute towards your
your image. And the radiations that are emitted by each radionuclide, you can find that in the resources available, like the slides. So if you have a look on the box folder, you'll get what you need for that. Okay, number two, and here we're going to combine these two points, two and five, because, as I said, when you mathematically combine the biological and the physical half-life, you get the effective half-life, so you need to know how that works out. And physical half-life, that, if you look back at 20.1, that is due to the radioactive breakdown of the nuclei. As they break down, there's fewer nuclei left to decay, so the activity decreases with time. That's due, so that's due to the radioactive nature of it. The biological half-life, this is due to, so when you have the, tra in, in terms of the tracer, when you have the tracer in the body, there's less and less of it left to decay and therefore expose your body to radiation. With the biological half-life, this is due to the body's natural processes which will remove the radionuclide from the body. So your body, whatever goes into your body, eventually will come out. And uh, the, so the body, that includes the radionuclide which is put in as a tracer. Your body will gradually remove that from the body. So there's a half-life due to the processes of the body as well. Right, uh, now you don't choose a radionuclide just based on the physical half-life or just based on the biological half-life. You base it on this, the effective half-life. And the calculation for that, uh, let's do this over here actually. The effective half-life is calculated from this equation. 1 over the effective half-life is equal to 1 over the biological plus 1 over the physical. And you will need to calculate the effective half-lives for all of these. And I'll give you an example calculation. So uh, I'm going to use fluorine, fluorine 18. Now this is my isotope, I'm doing an example for this, so you can't just copy this calculation, that's not going to contribute towards your assignment. You need to calculate for those four there. Fluorine 18 data, and all of the biological and physical half-lives are available in a table which is in the resources again in the box folder, so you have everything you need in order to perform the calculation. Fluorine 18 has a physical half-life of 110 minutes and a biological half-life of 6 hours. Now you can see that the two values there, they have different units. If I'm going to do this calculation with them, I need to make sure they have the same unit. So either I need to convert this into hours or this into minutes. I'm going to convert into minutes. Uh, the reason for that is that whenever you calculate the effective half-life, it is always going to be less than the smallest of the two out of the biological and physical half-life. So I know that the effective half-life is going to be less than TP, and therefore 110 minutes is just under two hours. It's, I think if we state it in that, in minutes it'll be fine. But if you were to do it in hours, that would be okay as well. So let's put our values in there. Oh, let's do, sorry, conversion. To convert that into minutes is 6 times 60, which is 360 minutes. And then we do our calculation. So we'll calculate that bit. 
first, and that is equal to 0.0119. I'm not too worried about the unit at this stage, because this is one stage of the calculation. You must remember that you've just calculated the one over the effective half-life, or the reciprocal of the effective half-life. That's not the answer that you need to state. We need to do the next stage of the calculation, which is to take the reciprocal of this value. And then we would get the effective half-life of 84 minutes. That's the one you need to state. So that's the combined effect of the radionuclide decaying through the radioactive process and the body removing the radionuclide from, it, from the body. So that's the effective half-life you need to do that calculation for those four. Next we have the energy level of the gamma radiation. And this is all about the image quality. Okay, and uh, it's measured in the, the, the photon energy is measured in kilo electron volts. So that's the what that's what you're looking for when you're looking for the energy levels of the radiation, some the value of it in kilo electron volts, which may be a range of values because they don't all emit perfectly you single uh, energies, energy photons. Um, now, gamma cameras, they're sensitive to a particular range of photons. So, uh, that mean, what that means is that those photons, photons in that energy range, they're the best ones for getting the image you need. So, you've got a, a range range for the best quality. You can range, you can image rather with photons outside of that energy range, either too high or too low, but the image quality is not as good. So you should find out the, the uh, energy levels for those four and then discuss or just mention the effect on the image quality. Um, for example, ID131 has photons which are higher energy level than the sensitive range for the gamma, pho gamma camera. Okay, so you've got some idea of what you need to go on there. Okay, uh, number four. Here, what we're talking about is the toxicity. So chemical properties, that's about the toxicity of the radionuclide. So many elements or compounds that you can use for as tracers in the body do have uh, or are toxic. Um, so that obviously affects what you can do with it. You can still, even if it's toxic, you can use small quantities of it to produce an image. But that's a limitation, isn't it, that you can only use a small amount. can, uh, but obviously tox toxic materials are not desirable. So find out if these materials are toxic and therefore what, uh, how that's going to affect how they're used in imaging. So we've got the toxicity. Number five, I'm not going to talk about because I've already talked about it over here. Uh, number six, this is the behaviour of the tracer inside the body. What we want to do with the tracer is we want to replicate the normal behaviour of the body as much as possible and the fluids that are moving through the body because the tracer will be moving through with fluids. So we want to replicate that 
as best as we possibly can. So that's what this is all about. So replication of the body fluids and systems. In order to achieve this replication of bodily fluids, you can chemically attach some traces to a wide range of chemical compounds. So you can do a wide range of different studies with, it, with your tracer, that one tracer. With some, however, you can only do one type of study with it. So you should uh, have a look at what studies are possible with those tracers and whether they can be chemically attached to various compounds to, to increase the number of studies you can do. Some studies that you want to particularly look out for on this point are ventilation studies, so looking at the lungs and the, how they up, um, take air in and exhale the air. Blood flow to heart muscles and thyroid examination, so you particularly want to look out for those ones with these isotopes. If you had one tracer that you could do a wide range of studies with, which included some studies which there, for which there are traces that can only be used for that study, then clearly the one that can do lots of them would be preferable because you only have to handle one isotope and then you just, you just store that and use that by, um, for the study that you want to do by chemically attaching it to the, chem the compound that you need. Whereas if you have to have one isotope per study, then obviously you have to store lots of different isotopes and that can be problematic. So if there is a way of uh, doing lots of studies with just one isotope, that would be preferable. And maybe give that some consideration in your discussion as well. So have a look at these. You, know, you've, you've already, you would have already found out the numbers of studies you can do, so make reference to that as well. And that's what you need to do for 20.3 M2 criteria.